Hello boys and girls. So this video is the second part where I talk about regularity. Um, last week I talked about regularity and its analog in arithmetic theories, the least number principles. Both of those are minimality statements. Um, in this video, this will be a little bit more formal. Um, I talked about arithmetics and the relation between the minimality principle there and induction. And also in this video, induction will be uh, at the fore. We're going to talk about set induction, epsilon induction, and also a transfinite induction. We're going to have a bunch of nice proofs. Um, and uh, so with that said, this video is largely about set theory. I start again with a little bit of a rehash and, and another proof of something we have discussed already in this video. I recommend you watch this, um, but with that said, um, you know, let's jump into it. Um, before I uh, go through a bunch of simple statements that I'm going to make use of, I just recite what is the regularity statement. Well, uh, it's one of the um, axioms of the Mille frankel theory by the, by the verge of the other axioms being um, strong and have, having this and that implication, the regularity statement is generally, uh, you know, falls to the background um, because in practice you don't need it uh, too often. A lot of the nice implications that it has are already implied by other axioms in Similo frankel set theory. Um, but we will discuss in this video what it actually implies uh, on its own, so to speak or, you know, without assuming other, some other strong uh, statements, what it, what, what it relates to, I mean, spoiler, it's induction. <laughs> um, um, but uh, also, um, it is uh, an axiom of the classical theory, the classical Zemele Frankel theory, for example. In the last video, I already discussed how it was not a part of the Semelo system, right? The, I don't know, 15 years prior system in the early uh, 90, 21st, 20th century. Um, this is one aspect. And also uh, I've shown in a video a month ago how uh, it actually implies in combination with separation, a uh, law of excluded middle. So um, as has been custom on this YouTube channel, I'm going to talk about uh, constructive equivalence and how these all go together in this video. Um, okay, so um, let me quickly recite what the axiom is. Uh, it says that for all sets, if it's not the empty set, you know, the theory proves there's a unique empty set, this has very special properties it's singled out. If the set is not the empty set, then it contains an element which is actually disjoint from it. So which is totally different from it, which does not share uh, any elements. I'm uh, going to um, talk about intersection in a second here. Okay, so here is a bunch of uh, definitions, implications, equivalences that I'm going to make use of in this video. Um, I'm not going to dwell too long on them. You see them here on the screen and I will come back to them when I need them. But uh, I want to emphasize, you know, as um, I have done in previous videos, using class notation. So if I have any uh, predicate, then I express this statement, you know, that some small a um, exhibits the property by saying that the small a is an element of the corresponding class. In this case, I was even lazy enough to use the same letter for the predicate and the class. Um, and there's these notions of bounded uh, quantification. <clears throat> Whether um, I'm talking about the membership relation here or the smaller than relation, especially in arithmetic, you define those uh, as such. And I'm using the uh, backslash math PBU for the class of all sets. Um, intersection is defined as, as follows, right? I had these videos on, on Topoi, 
uh, I don't know how long ago. Where are they? <laughs> Huh, wait a minute. Where are my Topos videos? Ah, okay, here, right. So, um, I had these videos where I discuss uh, the interaction between um, sets and set few relaxed structures and logic in painful uh, detail. And so, intersection really is just a conjunction. Here, in this case, um, I'm taking the intersection of a set and a class and with the notation above, you know how this is to be understood. Um, okay, you know, statement of minimality means you have a relation and an, an object is minimal with respect to it if there is no other uh, y which is smaller than it. Um, and, you know, if you have a strict relation or um, a relation with re reflexivity, you define it uh, appropriately. Um, I, I mean, I will uh, make use of those, all these things when I get to them and then elaborate on it again. Um, here I emphasize that uh, the negation introduction principle, you know, I can write it as a theorem also. So if you assume a P and it implies a contradiction, uh, D, uh, then it means we judge that P is not true. And I emphasize that if D is, a, is of the form of a negation, then uh, you can also prove, of course, the negation of P like such. And I, I pointed out to highlight um, that a double negation, if even if you can uh, constructively not remove it, has a lot of value if you can show that uh, these stuffs can be proven because you can, for example, prove, uh, use it to prove the negation of something else, among other things. And this will po uh, pop up a, a few times in this video. Um, okay, some identities and uh, some statements. I think I've written them all down in a constructive fashion. They are mostly like special cases of, of this nice one, which says that uh, you have two equivalent ways of characterizing the separation of two classes, right? So if A and B are classes, and they are, if you think of Venn diagrams, if they are apart from each other, then it means there is not an X which is in both of them at the same time. And another way of stating the same thing is that all elements which are part of the class A are not part of the class B, right? So you have two blobs which are apart from each other. I mean, they don't have to be blobs. They can, of course, be yeah, generic um, classes, but this, char this characterizes that they are separate. and. Um, it is important because this equivalence enables you to sw switch around with the quantifiers and if you interpret the, um, the existential statement as a sort of uh, disjunction over uh, some domain, for example, the domain of two elements or, or more or infinitely many, um, then you can also easily uh, show or motivate at least the bunch of other statements which are here. Um, one uh, that uh, I'm going to make use of, uh, I think right away is, is this here, like if A implies uh, not B, then B implies not A. And this is of course an equivalence uh, because it's symmetrical. Um, and contraposition, yeah. And um, also I'm going to make use immediately of this thing. So. Uh, this, uh, this statement when you say for all x holds that if x is c for some given c, this implies p of x and c. Well, if this holds for all x, uh, then in particular it holds also for x equals to c. Um, and uh, by reflexivity, c equals to c, of course. And then you have uh, p of c of c. So this is, this is sort of clear. Uh, this sort of implication will be part of some induction statements and particular proofs that we are going to do. So the simplification here um, is uh, is relevant. And also, if um, clearly if this holds, and the at least here if the equality is decidable as in our arithmetic cases, then you can also go in the other direction. Okay. So uh, I will not recite again the von Neumann model, which of course I have defined it in the last video. Um, 
but I mean you can quickly look at it here and uh, what will play a special role in this video is the notion of uh, transitivity a transitive set is one where um, for all elements in it set in in them if they are part of it if they are a member then they are also a subset so all elements of uh, set are also in X um, and okay this is a feature of the Neumann model there and um, uh, there's many ways to set up ordinals uh, they are not necessarily constructively equivalent and uh, a good one is transitive set of transitive sets so the von Neumann natural numbers have this property right they are transitive you remember you write on the number seven it contains the number um, four um, but the number four is just a set containing all numbers below four in the natural numbers and these are all members of the set seven as well right so you can see this is a transitive set uh, and indeed it's even a transitive set of transitive sets um, and so this is uh, an important one I mean this is the start of the ordinals okay um, so with that said uh, give me a few minutes to rehash some things of arithmetic before we really jump into set theory so I've written that down again the induction statement for a particular uh, proposition Q and uh, also the complete induction, right? I've emphasized in the last video, induction uses the uh, null, uh, null, zero array. I don't know, how do you say it in English? Uh, like the, the constant symbol zero and the operation S um, to capture induction statement. And I've uh, hinted at how to prove complete induction from it which uses the smaller than relation, which in the standard setup where you have this, you know, signature with zero and successor is defined um, in terms of those. Um, so this is another induction statement. And um, for the remainder of this proof here, I'm going to write the, this uh, smaller than relation as in a generic way. I just mean the smaller than relation on the natural numbers but but I write it in this way to sort of highlight where the relation is uh, at every part of the proof and um, then you can also see um, how this all generalizes because um, while I'm not going to elaborate on really more general uh, order structures for example value orderings and so on uh, a lot of the things translate to a more general notion in of induction in lattice structures or something like that. In this video, I'm talking about the smaller than relation and membership relation, but there is a broader context in which you can also see these things. So uh, this is my statement of complete induction here. These are the same statements. Okay, so let's take the contrapositive. So not uh, this conclusion here implies not um, this assumption. Um, and we are going to now pass from the some proposition to the counter examples for the uh, proposition so to speak um, the negation of um, Q uh, I do that so um, you get uh, all the negations in that you need to do some uh, nice operations to get a nice end result so to speak um, so we get here a bunch of ne negation statements right um, and then for all not, as we have seen above, we can flip, right? I, I motivated that with, with the separation of classes. Um, so we get this statement here. Um, we, we can read it as if it can be uh, ruled out that there doesn't exist an M which fulfills T, right? In particular, if there exists an M which fulfills T, uh, then uh, also not not this sort of statement. We just derived it from complete induction. Um, we can, I think I, I did it here, yeah. Uh, you know, I can pass to a weaker statement by removing the double negations here in the assumption, right? This assumption um, is harder to fulfill, you know? It's harder to actually prove that something exists than constructively at least than the double negation of it. So um, by um, using the stronger statement in the assumption for the principle, uh, I can use this whole principle in fewer cases. And in this sense, it's weaker. 
um, but this is actually what I want to use here. So uh, here I rehash what I already did in the previous videos. Uh, sorry for the cut, I had to fix a LaTeX uh, error here. Um, so, okay, um, fixing a C and also looking at a particular uh, predicate, the predicate T of K shall be that K equals to C, right, to the equality um, statement for C. Um, there are a bunch of things that are true and then we get a nice implication. So what is true for sure is that uh, TC of C holds because of reflect reflexivity, right? So C is equal to C for sure. And then also um, this statement here in the big bracket uh, is absurd or implies the uh, false statement as follows. So let's say C is in relation to uh, C and you know, under the hood, R is just another word for the smaller than relation in the arithmetic is defined above. And also assume that there is some N which has this property. So on the one hand, the N which is postulated to exist to has, have this property is actually also going to be C. So assume there's an N which has the property of being equal to C, meaning N is C. Um, and the property we look at is the following. For all um, K for numbers, if they are in the relation, um, the R relation with N, then this implies that they don't have uh, the statement uh, T, which is the quality to C. Okay, but the problem is now, um, if we have assumed that um, uh, RCC holds, and if N equals to C, then um, we can also look at uh, K equals to C, and then we find that C ha is both itself, which is trivial, and it's also not itself, which is a contradiction. Okay, so here we get this statement. Um, this is the negation of this, this statement here. So if we then assume this, uh, this principle, what, which was implied by induction, um, then uh, we find out that um, this uh, relation cannot possibly hold, right? Because if M holds and um, we look at it for T equals to the equality with uh, to C, so if um, they, uh, but this, this statement, um, uh, we have uh, just C, um, then uh, the induction statement here says, it's not true that that thing holds, but we like it's not true that this thing is negated, right? So double negation. It's not true that open bracket this holds, but we have just proven that this holds if this has, assuming that this has the, this R property. So um, uh, something must may be um, wrong in our assumptions, and the only thing that is not you know postulated here was this thing. So it's not the case that. RCC, right? As in the last video, um, I'm going through the proof, but I'm ha having just a few simple uh, symbols here on my screen, and I'm not sure how clear it is, but uh, I hope you followed this sort of argument. Okay, and now we do the same thing again, but because I actually wanted to do this in the last video, but uh, I cut it through time. Um, we do the same thing again, but we we actually don't go through these steps. We don't do the contraposition and so on and so forth. We actually Im uh, directly use the um, complete induction statement for that. So how does it look here? Well, um, the complete induction uh, statement for this predicate, right? Um, if you plug it in, sorry for scrolling so much. So this is the statement. Um, and we're, what we are going to use as, um, as Q is K does not equal to C. So that is exactly this statement here, right? And um, I'm using the equivalence from above that if A implies not B, then B implies not A. So I flipped is, these things around. So that says then for all K, if K equals C, then not R, right? And then I'm using, you know, apart from using this statement, I'm also using this statement that I have elaborated on um, and so, 
um, I can reduce this whole block uh, for this uh, arithmetic statement to just the negation of of um, of R C N, and then uh, I play the same game again, and I get again, not uh, R C C, and this statement here also I can switch a quantifier as and get that. So it's the same sort of statement. This is actually a little bit neater. Um, and uh, finally, before, well, not even, uh, so some more statements on arithmetic, I've forgotten those. I also want to emphasize that, you know, um, okay, let's uh, look at a peek forward, right? What we are going to discuss next is a set induction or epsilon induction, and it takes this form. You know, it has the same shape, so to speak, as uh, the complete induction statement. And um, what I've written down here is a short argument that um, despite complete induction formally looking a little bit different than um, the normal induction statement, you can also uh, like prove an implication of a disinduction which still uses um, the uh, which still uses uh, at least implicitly again the um, uh, successor and zero operation, which basically like goes just from one to the next and not like here looks at all uh, numbers below a certain number, which still has this step-by-step -step aspect to it, but which in form um, does not have the, the zero element implicit, right? Because the um, complete induction does not have the does not talk directly e explicitly about the zero element because it's always part here in, of the smaller relation. Um, but um, uh, with, with you know with n equals zero. Um, but uh, the set induction statement also looks more like complete induction, and just to show that um, the there's also a version of this, um, so to speak, um, which looks like set induction. I demonstrated here. So I'm making the case here that. You know, piano arithmetic proofs, or Heitinger arithmetic proofs, that every number has a, a predecessor number. And so if you then define uh, a Q minus one, uh, use this notation here, um, and set it up like this, where this says either n equals zero, and then the uh, Q minus one is trivially true, or um, there exists a P, which is the predecessor, and uh, Q of P holds. So this is basically the the Q statement just shifted down uh, one and trivializing the zero of case. Um, then we can write uh, we can prove here by induction this statement, which also expresses um, induction um, and does not have an explicit zero case. Uh, it also looks sort of like a complete induction statement or set induction that we are going to see. Um, yeah, and I also, I mean, I will also sort of skip this, but I want to emphasize that if this is complete induction, then you can read this as, as a nice strengthening of an excluded middle statement, right? So um, if you make use of, uh, I didn't write it down maybe. Yeah. So I'm 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 comparing this to um, an excluded middle statement. So I'm using the classical equivalences of you know a implies b is equivalent to not a or b, and then I can take induction and uh, remove the implications in induction and use um, conjunctions and uh, uh, disjunctions, and I get this sort of statement. Um, this says that you know either Q holds for all numbers, or there is a counterexample to it, meaning there is an, um, an uh, there's a smallest counterexample here even. So there is an um, an n for which it does not hold, and also for all uh, numbers below n it does hold, right? So this says there is a smallest counterexample. This is sort of this is sort of a, if you want, um, 
in this clause a negative formulation of induction, right? Instead of you saying that um, Q for all a M is implied if for every number holds that if it holds for all numbers, it holds also holds for this. So the complete induction statement, you can also like phrase it classically by saying, by, by basically embedding this uh, least number principle in it. You say um, either it holds for all or there is a smallest counter example. Right? And um, I just write this thing down here to emphasize that um, this reads like a strengthened um, excluded middle statement. You say either it holds for all or there is a counter example. This is just excluded middle. And this is sort of a stronger one because it um, it uh, restricts um, the class of numbers for which you actually have to check for a count example. You um, you can actually come from the bottom and and uh, uh, you will find a count example which uh, is not only a count example but it's also a minimal count example. Um, okay, it's just a side note. Okay, so um, half an hour in. Now we're actually going to talk about set theory. <laughs> So this is the epsilon induction statement. Um, it reads very similar to complete induction is set for all sets. If for all uh, elements, for all sets X, if, if for all elements Y in, in X, um, uh, some property holding, if that implies that the set itself has the property, then by this uh, postulate, and this, for example, a postulate of constructive Zermelo Frankel theory, um, the property actually holds for all sets. Um, so, so again, this is uh, saying that you can prove that any property holds actually is actually true for all sets by um, validating that. For all, for any set, um, the property um, holds when assuming that all elements of it ha have the property, right? Okay. Um, so for the sake of this video, I have drawn a little picture to you know envision the set theoretical universe. It is basically the standard picture that you um, get taught um, where you think of sets as this nested structure that essentially go down to uh, the empty set. I'm using sort of a um, cautious language here because what we here discuss in this video is exactly the axiom of regularity, which implies that those are really the sets. Um, in, like in principle, that, that this, this is what enforces this sort of picture of sets. Um, and I don't want to, you know, make judge that there are no, no other sets. This is just what, ha what happens if you adopt the regularity axiom or the set induction axiom. And the picture um, looks as, uh, as follows. So the picture I'm talking about is here this right part. Um, this is, um, you can think of it as a small cutout from the bottom of the set theoretical universe. Think of the empty set, an empty set here represented as uh, the uh, von Neumann natural number zero. It sits there at the bottom and it just so happens that all sets, whatever sets they contain, ev eventually are just the sort of lattice structure which always leads down to the empty set. So for example, here I have some set uh, which has three elements. It contains the empty set, it contains the set containing these two numbers. It also contains an, a, a set which contains one more set and there are some numbers in it. These examples are uncreative in the sense that they're all just containing numbers or sets, sets of numbers. But you can also think of some, you know, there's the natural numbers in there, the real numbers, there are some design functions in there, some topolo topological spaces are in these sets in the Cimelo universe. Um, Cimelo Frankel universe, if it's just this. <laughs> Um, and we have the relation which, for the sake of this video, we can think of as this sort of uh, graph which goes up, this sort of lattice. Um, I have here this free element set, where there's a set with cardinality free, 
and it contains three elements. I've written LM here, which pointed another set, you know, this set also, um, uh, the number three is, is itself, you know, in the phenomenal model represented as this set and so on and so forth. There's this sort of web. And also there is a subset relation. So for example, this set, which contains zero and three and four is a subset of this. I have like highlighted this with this bold laser subsets will be also important in a second. Um, and what the axiom of regularity implies, what we will also prove in this video is that these sorts of um, sets which contain themselves are ruled out, right? So this um, here um, with this, um, this is maybe a little bit, let's actually kill this off for a second. So this is going to be a set S. Um, this, this is by the way, a website called JS Paint. This is like just Microsoft Paint with JavaScript in, in a browser. I will use that maybe more often. Um, so here we imagine uh, something which is ruled out by the timelo frankel axioms, namely a set S, which uh, has a property of actually being equal to the singleton, which contains just itself, right? So I go back here. So S is ought to be equal to the singleton containing S and using that again, this is also in equal to the singleton containing the singleton containing S and so on and so forth. This is an infinite descending membership chain. They will be important in this video again. And I uh, like draw it, uh, represent it here, but this set obviously contains something, right? It contains itself. So there's an error going down and this is also uh, contained in something, namely itself again. So there's an error going up and something that is in it. And so in a way this goes in a circle, you can think of it, right? This is sort of a structure which is different in here because this does not have a bottom compared to everything else here, which sort of on all ends bottoms out in a zero. So this is uh, this is the sort of standard picture of the Timelio universe and the axiom of regularity, as we will see, enforces that this does not actually work. And also induction does um, have such implications. So. Um, here as a side note, um, if, uh, you know, in the, in the assumption here to prove that some, um, properties fulfilled by all sets, we also have to check, we have to check this for all sets X and we also have to check it for the empty set. Um, but in the empty case of the empty set, there is no Y in it, it, right? So similar to what I did right above here, where I, um, where I rewrote Q of zero as this sort of trivial implication, right? Q of minus one of zero is trivial by definition. Um, the implication um, that contains the empty set is still there, um, but the problem is that just this assumption here for the empty set, X equals the empty set becomes trivial. So we still have to prove the, the bottom case. Written with this assumption is just vanishes from the formal expression, but it's still there. Then we have to prove a property for the empty set and we have then for all other sets, we also have to prove this implication. And when we manage to do that, then this axiom says that the property holds for all sets. And we will see how this axiom rules out certain ideas of sets as I just described in this picture. Um, okay, so here's another class theoretical rewrite on the one hand, because it's nice, because it like makes it so compact and also it kind of shines a light on it because this um, for all y in x can also be written as I do here as um, with the subset uh, relation, right? So we um, I take the same uh, psi as before, uh, but now I write it as a, a, as a class and on the capital psi is going to be this class, which is all the sets which will fill this uh, property. And then the statement here, you know, for all, uh, X, which have this sort of property, but uh, then this property um, just expresses the um, the the excess 
uh, this is just an expression in terms of the excess elements, right? And so if you um, then uh, write it down and use the class notation um, not with the abuse of the element hood relation also for classes, then you end up with um, just this this sort of statement. I hope you, you sort of you can see it how that um, uh, goes there, goes together. So obviously um, phi uh, psi of x is the same as x in capital psi, and uh, this statement exactly says that um, all um, all x must in the assumption here have all their elements also be part of this class and so that's how this comes about and this statement here is just saying that the property psi is actually the trivial property the property which is true for all sets already and so this implies then this this class is the universal class and the other direction is also trivial because every element x is in the um, class of all sets so you can also just just as well write the equivalence and so it becomes this sort of very compact statement um, um what is uh here interesting to say is that uh you know since um um sets can be on the, understood as particular classes right the 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 sets are the classes where the, your quantifier range over so if um psi were a set or if psi is a set let's say you know without any judgment without having this sort of similar frankly intuition a priori if um, psi is a set uh, then i want to emphasize that um the x is also a, a subset of itself for every set right and so then this would already say um, that the psi is member of psi itself right if psi is a set then the case where you use psi as x says that it must contain itself um, and here you can also already get a hin hint on why um, that axiom um, you know, trivializes um, the world a little bit because it says the only only um, uh, the only object which can have this property uh, is the universal class. So in particular, um, you will not find a set. But uh, it might still be that there you can still imagine some classes which might have the property and, and we will see other, other nice uh, so implications of this. Okay. Uh, I also want to emphasize that above I've defined the transitive set, right? I have written down that I've said that... Um, if you have a transitive set, a transitive class here, I have called it uh, sigma, then for all elements of the transitive class, um, the uh, element is also a subset of the class. And here, look, this is basically just the two, <laughs> the two symbols are swapped around, right? So this hints at relating to it. Okay, so uh, trans, so this is epsilon induction what we discussed here and there is then also uh, transfinite induction so what we want to do here is we make things more complicated we we don't just uh, talk about one predicates but we split it in two so we consider this particular case where the uh, psi is actually an implication right so again i'm using two predicates in the sense that the class is a predicate and this this, this is a predicate um, I'm switching around between predicates and classes here. Um, but it will be nice for the rewritings that we are going to do uh, in a second. So if you plug that in here, then, uh, you know, if psi is this implication where um, the, uh, this, uh, the left-hand side is written as this membership relation, then we can rewrite such statements, you know, for all psi as a bounded statement, right? In, in, in the way we've defined the bounded quantifier, this exactly means that for if for all uh, set, if they are in that set, then only then it holds. And using this, oops, <laughs> I have lost the, 
uh, here it must read P, right? <laughs> the statement must end in uh, P of Z. Uh, ignore that this, that this is missing, but you know what I mean. Um, and uh, similarly, we can um, use the, uh, the, the rewriting some of the equivalences that I introduced at, uh, at the front. You know, you can jump back if you want to uh, like think about which um, tools I use there. But basically I'm using the um, currying, uncurring equivalence to um, move the um, class membership to the front. And here we have um, on the one hand, the statement that Y must be member of X, but also by uh, that statement, um, Y must be member of Sigma, you know, if you plugged it in. So what we get out is exactly this sort of uh, statement. Okay, so far so good. Um, and so this holds for the special case of, of the set induction statement. And if I'm looking at transitive classes, which have this property, then um, because um, all X is also subs, uh, like subsets of Sigma, then um, this uh, intersection statement simplifies, right? Because if um, any X is in the transitive class, that means uh, the, the X itself is also a subset. So the, the intersection um, picks out everything that's in X. And so this becomes simple. So in the case of a transitive class, this um, intersection is gone. And what I'm left with, apparently I have not written it down anymore, but what I'm left with is the same statement here with an X here. And that is, if you look at the quantifiers, this is just an the induction statement inside of this transitive class, right? And so induction wor works particularly nicely in these classes and the ordinals. And then if you're discussing, like I'm, I'm not going to go much deeper in uh, the transitive induction um, use and transitive regression and so on and so forth. but. Um, what then happens is that you you have uh, an, an, like classically in any case you can split off the um, the tasks of proving this implication because you have the successor you know constructively this does not work um, directly but in any case even constructively you have this nice nicer induction statement for ordinals and in the classical case you can do transfinite induction as you're used to it with you know, proving something for successors and all limit cases. This is just uh, this statement split up in two parts, making it even more approachable. And then you can prove something for all P, which is missing here. Okay, um, and if you want, you can read this as well. So here um, I do everything in terms of membership relation, but again, you can talk about some relation, some well order, for example, uh, on a domain and then this intersection mm, here, right? This Y being a member of the intersection just says that Y is a member of X and also Y is a member of Sigma. And um, this then just becomes this conjunction and um, it has some general implication. Uh, we are going to also in this case, as we've already motivated with the least number statement above, we're going to do um, the argument uh, in the, right away that uh, this rules out certain things and I've written them down here. Okay, so uh, in the next step, we are again looking at negated statements as we did with arithmetic before, right? I talked about Q and um, choosing not T. We're doing the same thing here. Uh, we are um, taking as Psi a particular uh, not S. I use S because, um, you, you know, for Sigma, this is the, the class corresponding to Sigma. This both start with S. Um, and this is just a more special case of what we just had. You know, this is basically when you take this special case and use the trivially always false statement for P. So this statement becomes Psi of x becomes 
uh, x not in sigma or um, x does not ho have the property s. Uh, and then if you look at, at, at the induction statement, um, then for all uh, y in the intersection uh, holds the trivial, uh, trivially false statement, then this renders this intersection as the empty set, but this is itself negated. So it says it's not the empty set. This is a sort of double negation then. And similar here, again, wait, this is missing. So let's do this. So if um, for all uh, set, set is not uh, in sigma, that means sigma is the empty set. So what we get is uh, is this statement here, right? So this is the, the intersection we had just had. Um, we have a double negation in the sense that in the characterization of the empty set, there's a negation. We have one other negation, right? This is, again, this is this is bot. This is bot. It's both false. And I just argued that the impl implication is also this. So we get this sort of statement, and you know we are already very close to the regularity statement, and we are still uh, going strong constructively. Okay, then here we have a for all not this thing is the empty set, so we can also again flip the the quantifiers, and we get this sort of thing. Um, okay, and this uh, I've. I don't know if I've elaborated it or if you read it, but um, I've also characterized this minimality statement in lattice theory, and you can also read this in this way here. Okay, so uh, now let's discuss actually self-membership, and we will see how that falls out. So going back to this picture, oops, going back to this picture, right? So we have this, we're going to consider this set which has the property of containing exactly itself. How do we write it down in uh, formal logic? Well, you say for all x, if x is in it, that x uh, means that this is the same as s itself. Right? This is the characterization of this singleton, and um, we are going to consider the property s as here, which is again the equality relation. Right above this was t, and also it's not an accident and that they choose s and t. Right? Extremely well planned ahead. Um, so, um, a, a few statements which are simple, uh, S is in S, of course, for all uh, X in S, uh, um, they also contain X. I mean, it's clear from this picture, right? Oh, come on. F uh, with S, S is in S, and for all elements of S, which is just S, S is again in S. Okay. Um, so that holds. So here we have a bunch of statements and then we can uh, look at what does actually the uh, statement that S intersect with X uh, is the empty set, which is part here, right? Or let's say here. What does that actually mean? Well, if you um, apply the definition of the intersection with this conjunction um, and use these very simple statements, then you find that this thing actually reduces to this simple thing. Um, but then uh, assuming a set induction, i.e. assuming this, this, these statements as well, and uh, the fact that the um, our sigma is by our assumption non-empty, right? our sigma is the singleton set which contains S, and this is an inhabited set, it contains S, um, the conclusion here is contradictory because it cannot be the empty set and uh, have an element and if you write it down then um, you find that the assumption is true the conclusion is false and we find uh, we get a contradiction yeah you should go that uh, go through with that uh, on yourself I'm just giving you here the the the, 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 um, the steps um, but if you do it on pen and paper you'll see that how things cannot go together there's just too many things true at, the, at once and we ruled out at least this simple infinite descending membership chain. And you know you cannot uh, just use this. You can write on a lot of equivalences, and you find you can do the proof with all of these sort of uh, uh, induction statements. Although this is, might be maybe the, the shortest one. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. And since I'm already an hour in. Um, there's a bunch of things I've written down. You can re reflect on it in terms of this subset version of the induction statement and, and you see how um, 
the axiom sort of demands that sets are sort of more simple and and um, that you would have these competing domains. And this is a lot like Skolan described 100 years ago, this sort of scenario. And you can really feel how then this induction axiom uh, just says that this is not the way we want to go. Um, okay, pushing forward here. Uh, a note on infinite descending membership change more uh, more generally and especially in, rela in relation to the axiom of dependent choice. So we had this statement here, sorry. Um, uh, there uh, does not exist an X such that it has an empty intersection with um, sigma, right? As, uh, like to, this is a negative statement. There does not exist an, an X where the intersection is empty. This is the um, assumption in the, that you can use in with this uh, principle. Uh, a more um, more uh, active statement is to say that um, you know, this holds for all classes and. Um, a, a strong assumption is this sort of existence statement where I say if for all um, elements in sigma there actually exists one um, element which uh, is in it and so the intersection is uh, not empty right the intersection between the sigma and x is not not empty if this is fulfilled then certainly in the in the class then certainly this is also fulfilled um, and this is, however, uh, uh, the condition for the membership relation that we use in dependent choice. So if you look at the axiom of dependent choice, you can read it here. Uh, it says if you have uh, a total relation um, such that the existing statement is true, then what you get is a sequence. Uh, read the statement. Um, and so as I write down here, if you assume that there is an element in sigma and you assume uh, dependent choice and you assume the induction principle and thereby this implication, um, then uh, you have assumed that this is non-empty, but um, by the uh, by the principle um, you find that it is empty, so you get a contradiction. Okay, uh, then um, uh, coming closer to the regularity statement, we want to look at contraposition in the same way we looked at the induction before. So uh, flipping the induction, the set induction around, we get this statement. I, um, I think we I will not make much use of this, but flipping the um, statement around which is the regularity statement for every class um, in this constructive version so it says then the sigma being non-empty implies then this double negated um, this double negated uh, statement of this form so we get this thing and this is basically already um, this is basically already regularity or rather it's actually stronger because you know regularity if you remember I will scroll completely up regularity was a statement which holds for all sets but our induction statement actually was a, a schema which holds for all classes so here we are actually are still a little bit apart from regularity in the sense that on the one hand we have the universal universal quantify over all sets and here we talk about classes and in one of the last proofs, we will bridge that gap. Um, but it shows, this already now shows how uh, certainly classically um, set induction implies regularity, right? Okay, and I make even, I've written down a, a few formal notes as well. You can read that if you want. Um, yeah, so again, going on the classical side and making use of these classical equivalences, getting rid of the implications. We also see here that there is this analogon to, between set induction and um, uh, an excluded middle statement, where, where this is basically a stronger version of that, which relates to counter, counter examples and so on, if you will. 
Okay, um, and I think the last, yeah, the last proof of this video is now, now that we've already seen how clearly set induction implies regularity, we also want to go in the other way. And the only thing we really need to do there, right, because we already, right, we already have, um, like all these steps we did, do, taking contrary positives and looking at double, uh, negations and so on and so forth. All these equivalences classically we go, can go in the other direction as well, right? We already know from the video two, like two videos ago that regularity is a classical statement. So we can already use classical um, statements to prove the other direction, prove every instant of the set induction uh, sch schema from regularity using classical equivalences. We really only need to prove this thing um, the only difference left is between the statements is that this holds for classes and the regularity statements holds for all sets. And so what the proof that we are going to do um, will show is that despite um, the regularity statement being explained in terms of uh, uh, sets, it's just one statement, not a, sch a schema, we can actually um, abuse um, certain objects to make statements about any class. And these are objects that we are going to make use of are the transitive sets. Before we do the proof, uh, I have a small note uh, on the fact that transitive sets are actually relatively hard to get by in a set theory in the sense that you need a regularity to show that um, all sets have a transitive closure, for example. Um, so this is actually an interesting side note. Um, if you believe, if you adopt the, that every set has a transitive closure, then there's a small step that you can skip in the proof. Um, but otherwise, it's a pretty straightforward proof anyhow. Okay, so uh, for this final proof, um, proof of this statement um, for any class sigma, I've drawn a second, another picture. Namely, um, well, I will get to it in a second, but um, but um, again, what what the proof uses is the concept of transitive sets, and it goes as follows. So, let's say um, we uh, we consider any class for which we want to prove this this sort of regularity statement, and. Uh, let's say there's like this is just a preliminary, preliminary uh, comment. Let's say there's any transitive set. What we're going to make use of is the intersection of the, this transitive set and sigma s. And because uh, t is transitive and this is some class, there are some implications. Namely, in particular, if x is in s, if x is in the intersection of those, then x is per definition in sigma, and also per definition of transitivity, x is a subset of t. And if X is a subset of T, uh, then it also follows that the um, intersection of X and S, right? A S is a, is a subset of T. And then uh, the intersection of X and S is equal to the intersection of whatever is, uh, you know, left there in um, both in T and in Sigma. Um, and um, I have drawn it like for this sort of small implication, I've drawn a Venn diagram. I mean, you can also like write it out with, con with a conjunction. It's a little bit of a longer statement, but um, what we have here is this. So we have a uh, Sigma, uh, this is this set, and I have, I've drawn various cases so that you, you know, can get a hold on, on the situation. Uh, but this is just Venn diagrams. It's just a help, you know, do the formal proof if you're interested. Um, so there's an, an X in, in Sigma, right? So, um, this is, this is clear. Like if, uh, here's even X in S, um, right. I'm, I'm, I'm going a little bit ahead because for the proof of the statement, we are going to, uh, start with an X in Sigma. Um, but if it's in S, then it's certainly also in Sigma. So if X is in Sigma, um, then we are going to assume there's a transitive set such that X is a subset of that, right? And then we're going to consider the intersection of Sigma and T. In this case, this is this uh, sort of 
intersection. This is this S. Right? This is a, sort of the situation. And what we're going to do in the proof is we're going to um, uh, make a case distinction either S, uh, because we're in a classical world, right? Either S is the empty set or not. Uh, here in this picture, this S is clearly not the empty set, but there could also be other situations. So here we have a situation, what have we drawn? Yeah, this is very similar. The only only difference is that X is and has no, also no intersection with sigma. And then there's this situation where X uh, might still be in sigma, but uh, um, the whole transitive set um, in which uh, X uh, is is not um, intersecting with sigma. And in this case, S would be the empty set. There's no intersection between sigma and T. Okay, but this should just be a help for the for the proof for the visualization. So um, this is just uh, how we form this S, okay? Now to the proof. Okay, so we um, want to prove this implication for any class. So let's say there is some a set uh, which has the property characterized by the class, and I called it S. Um, and we say that, uh, we assume that Z is the subset of some transitive set you know, take the transitive closure or in some other way prove that transitive sets exist, um, then you can form S as above. So I called it actually S set, just to emphasize that this is the S formed by starting with set in sigma. Uh, as I said, we can make this case distinction for S being the empty set because we're in this classical setting. Um, if on the one hand S is the empty set, then it turns out that x equal to z actually fulfills the regularity principle because uh, by assumption z is in um, in sigma um, so there exists an x in sigma namely z and also the intersection uh, of z and sigma must be the empty set because well s is already empty and this intersection is actually um, a subset of this empty set, which is the empty set. And on the other hand, if S is uh, not the empty set, here should be a not. Um, so if <laughs> S is not the empty set, then um, by assumption regularity uh, holds for S. S is a set and we assume regularity and we want to prove this statement for classes. Um, but this exactly means that there is a, an x in s and this is necessarily also an s in sigma and then we have shown that we can actually replace uh, the the intersection of x with s with the intersection of s with uh, with uh, sigma right because this is also um, because you know, if x is in S, uh, and then is x is also in T, and T is a transitive set, so all this, all these things hold also for this element in in uh, in S, right? And so thereby um, we can just rewrite the statement for S as the same statement for sigma, and we have then established the regularity statement for this class. Um, and that uh, completes the proof and um, sorry for being a little bit angry uh, I didn't really want to make the video after having written the script and not having managed to do it in in uh, one and a half hours and now you get the other one and a half hour videos if you actually uh, you know if you actually watch the video to the end uh, comment below um, with the keyword with the secret keyword um, apple pie to let me know that you watched it till the end um, and I assume you watched it till the end because you wanted to learn, learn something. And I guess um, uh, I, I did my duty and actually go through all these sort of proofs and you have a better understanding of induction now. Um, I am uh, a fan of uh, natural number induction. I'm not so sure um, if you go, need to go much beyond that. At the moment, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on a very conservative streak. I like the things I'm interested in are just, I don't know, matrix operations and the st stuff I do at work for uh, very basic uh, 
Galilean geometry considerations and all this set theory stuff. I want to leave it behind me. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, it's, get, it's good to have a grip on things and seeing how strong things are, even if you're not using it. Uh, I guess because um, full uh, separation is so strong, you, people don't really see regularity or set induction um, as much. I mean, apart from set theorists and people who actually make use of that, but let's say normal people. Um, but nonetheless, I found thought it was it, it was worth it to cover this. Um, there's certainly no other video on YouTube which discusses regularity in any uh, such formal detail. So why not? And with that said, uh, I wish you a good evening.